This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 720, recorded on February 12th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Uh, gray, cold, supposed to snow later. Kind of miserable. Again, another day. Glad to be inside. Oh, 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 one big event here for everybody's uh, perusal. That's my second COVID shot. Upside down. It's your birthday. It's upside now down. Now bulletproof. Oh, the birthday, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't We don't pay attention to those things anymore, Alan. Very good. <laughs> also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, the weather down here uh, is unseasonably cold. It's uh, 32 degrees right now. The high today is going to be something like 34. Uh, and we're looking at a week of nighttime temperatures below zero. I've never seen yes. that here. Uh, we're looking at next Monday, a forecast for the overnight of three Fahrenheit. Wow. <laughs> From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's uh, 21 Fahrenheit today and um, kind of clouding over. It's supposed to get a little snow coming in, but uh, at least it's not down to three. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It's 28 degrees here and pretty gray as well. Um, I think we're looking forward to some ice storms um, in the next few days. Or not looking forward is a better way of phrasing it. <laughs> We have a guest today from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He needs no introduction. We talk about him all the time. Paul Offit, welcome to TWIV. Well, thank you for being for inviting me. It's <laughs> really a uh, pleasure for me. I, I, know, I listen to you all the time. We even have a little TWIV mug, so we're good. Nice. Um, it, is, it is overcast and cloudy. There's snow on the ground. It's one degree Celsius here, here in the Philadelphia area. Gosh, you you have such a neat background, Paul. That's beautiful. There's not no junk anywhere. How do you do that? <laughs> I don't, I'm I'm the guy who like doesn't have his book prominently displayed behind television. <laughs> That's right. A lot of people put their books behind them. Or a pet cat. <laughs> that might be later. That's a twist theme. Yes. If you like what we do here on TWIV, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. All right, Paul, so before we talk about vaccines and uh, all that, to get, tell us your history, uh, where you're from and trained and so forth. Well, I grew up in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I went to um, the, the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Then I trained in pediatrics at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Then I trained in infectious diseases at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And then began my scientific training at the Wistar Institute in the same lab, Walter Gerhardt's lab, with John Udell, who was the one who really turned me on to this week in virology. And I, I know you know John well. He has just, as always been, frankly, a science hero to me. He is the just a, just an amazing thinker and scientist. And he, and he was one of the first people who really, I was really exposed to as a scientist. Who knew I was like starting at the top? Yeah, John uh, is a lot of fun to have on. He, he's just full of knowledge, right? He can go on. You ask him a question, he just goes on and on. It's wonderful. Have a good time. When you were at the Wistar, did you know Hillary Koprowski? Of course. No, he was the head of head of Wistar at ah. the time. Um, I was working on rotaviruses in a flu lab and eventually you know, was was got to be part of a team headed by Stan Plotkin and Fred Clark that created the strains that became the bovine human reassortant rotavirus vaccine rototype, which was a 26 year effort, which is about how long it usually takes to make a vaccine. <laughs> I think now we've watched the vaccine be made in a year. Um, but I think when you put $24 billion into the effort, that helps. So you think so, it takes uh, money. What huh? years were you at Worcester? I was at Worcester from like 80 to 85. Then, then I went to Stanford, then came back and was there like in the late eighties between 87 and, and then beyond. What did you do at Stanford? Um, I worked in Harry Greenberg's lab and Harry <laughs> Fassel's lab doing T-cell cloning and things like that. Yeah, I know Harry Greenberg well. He's been on TWIV also. Good guy. He actually trains. I think he trained here at Columbia for part of his career. So, Paul, what? Uh, why did you want to go into medicine to begin with? What was the impetus? I didn't have any talent. You know, otherwise... <laughs> 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 
I couldn't sing. I couldn't <laughs> dance. I had, I had no discernible skills. So uh, <laughs> people do when they have no skills. They go. Oh, so lousy handwriting. <laughs> uh, that's a prerequisite, right? Dixon? That's not really a great recommendation for doctors. I, you know. <laughs> Ma'am. Do you still uh, see patients, or you're mostly in the lab? Yes, you still see patients. No, I still see patients. Yeah, I, I actually, the we we uh, the lab uh, we closed the lab actually about a year or so after the vaccine came out. So it's been mostly for me, you know, seeing patients and writing and sort of speaking and 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 we created something called the Vaccine Education Center in, about 20 years ago to try and counter all the misinformation that's out there about vaccines. I think for me, you know, because I got to see how one went from bench to bedside regarding the rotavirus vaccine, I got to see how hard it was to make a vaccine. And in the midst of all that, in 1998, when Andrew Wakefield published his paper claiming that the MMR vaccine caused autism, and then people stopped vaccinating their children with measles containing vaccine, I saw how easy it was to damn vaccines. And so we created our center to try and get sort of the scientific um, voice in that conversation. And it's been an education about how to try and communicate science to the public. Uh, so when was the, uh, when were you done with the Rotatech vaccine? So that, that vaccine was licensed and recommended for use in all children in the U.S. in 2006. Okay. And and that was the, the at the time you closed your lab? That's around, around Okay. That. So what at what age is the rotavirus vaccine given to kids? So it's given by mouth at two, four, and six months of age. And it's taken a virus which, you know, caused about 75,000 hospitalizations, about 60 deaths a year, and made it uh, – virtually disappear. I mean, it's actually an uncommon infection now in the United States. Is this a required uh, childhood vaccine? Right. It's a, it's a routinely recommended vaccine. Yes. And so how many doses do we give out in the U.S. every year? Do you know? Well, so the, the birth cohort is around three and a half to four million children in the U.S. Um, probably about 90 percent of children who are recommended to get the vaccine get it. And it's a three dose vaccine. Hmm. I didn't get it. I was before it was made. <laughs> Yeah, way before my time. Is the same vaccine used globally, and what's the impact of uh, rotavirus globally and the impact of the vaccine? Right, so there are two vaccines uh, that are used globally. The other is, is a product of GlaxoSmithKline called Rotorix, which is an attenuated human strain. Um, okay. And, and I would say that, that you know, thanks to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the vaccine has gotten out there. So it's you know it's estimated that typically in the U. Before there was a vaccine, before 2006, about 2,000 children died every day um, in the world from rotavirus. So it's really the biggest single killer of infants and young children. And what's interesting is that it's what got Bill and Melinda Gates into vaccines. I mean, it was rotavirus. I mean, here they they saw there was this virus that killed babies and. They'd never heard of it before, and they, they actually served as a tremendous pull mechanism, actually, to get the vaccine into the developing world. Seems wasn't to me this there, is wasn't enough. there a bit of a false start in rotavirus vaccines? I mean, they, it, this has been a, a, a hard thing to do. It didn't just take you 26 years. A lot of people have tried this, and there was, there was one that got all the way to market and then had a rare complication that turned out to nix that as well, right? That's right. It, it's, that's a very nice way to say it, that it was sort of a long road. It was, it was that was a painful experience. Yeah. In, in 1998, there was a vaccine called Rota Shield, which was uh, a, a reassortant uh, a simian human vaccines. And um, if 10 months into being uh, being routinely recommended by the, the CDC and obviously licensed by the FDA, it was found to be a rare cause of intestinal blockage called intussusception. It was rare, depending on which, which study you were looking at, between one in 10,000 and one in 30,000 recipients, but it was real. And so that drove it off the market. It was really the, the, the uh, there had been no vaccine removed from the market because of an issue of safety since the Cutter incident in 1955. I mean, this was the next one, like in the late 1990s. And it really, um, it occurred right around the time that people were worried about thimerosal and ethyl mercury containing preservative in vaccines and the notion by Andrew Wakefield that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused autism. That was all in the late 1990s. You yeah. the vaccines were on the run at that time. That was right when I was becoming a science journalist, by the way. <laughs> I seem to recall that there was uh, some uh, significant debate about whether or not the incidence of intussusception with that vaccine was really greater than the background incidence or not. But uh, you're saying it, it is at least marginally? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, you couldn't tell. 
that there was a, that there was a, a product that was introduced into the United States that increased the instance of interception. In other words, if you looked at high use states and low use states, you couldn't tell that that happened. And the reason is, and now we know this, that wild type rotavirus, natural rotavirus, also is a rare cause of interception. So the question is, which was rarer, interception caused by the vaccine or interception caused by the the, the virus? Okay. I think it probably was a wash. It was all said and done. Uh, and it strikes me that. Uh, in my mind, at least, uh, rotavirus is kind of one of these uh, sleeper illnesses that, uh, especially in, in this country, people say, oh, well, you know, some diarrhea, you know, no big deal. You know, it's uh, being a kid. But if you look globally, it's a killer. Yeah, and it's a rare killer in this country. Certainly when I was training as a resident, um, it was the bane of my existence. I mean, you were t t treating a lot of kids who were severely dehydrated. Um but you know, it's it's uh, you're right. I mean, in the world, it's a killer. In, in the U.S., because we have medical access, because we have the kind of uh, therapies that enable us to quickly get uh, you know get fluids into children that need it. But I, when I was a resident, I saw a child die of rotavirus. I mean, I'll never forget it. It, it was a, a about an eight-month-old child who'd only been sick for a day. The mother was great. She did what she was supposed to do. She tried to give her child frequent sips of, of water that contained uh, uh, you know sugar and, and electrolytes. But, you know, it's hard to rehydrate children by mouth when they're vomiting. So she brought the child in and, and the child was severely dehydrated. We brought the child back to the treatment room and then we couldn't get an intravenous line in because the child was so dehydrated. So we called a surgeon to come and put a cut down down. But before we before that surgeon could come down, you know, we took this 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 uh, bone marrow needle. You know, it's just sort of this large bore needle and bore it into the this sort of the area just just below the knee and the tibia to try and just put fluids into the bone marrow that we hope would then be reserved into the circulation to save this child's life, who was now in shock. And by the time the surgeon got there, it was too late. We couldn't revive the child. So I saw a child die. And then, you, then the worst thing that you can do in, in medicine happens. The mother who had had a perfectly normal child two days ago, sitting in the waiting room, you now have to go out there and tell her that her child has passed away. It's a, that it's one of those scarring moments in medicine. She was. That's and actually, I would imagine that the uh, impact of the vaccine is it's just as important to consider that it decreases the hospitalizations or eliminates them even from rotavirus. That's exactly right. Yes. Are there are there any vaccines for the rotavirus that are a single dose? Because otherwise the chances of wiping out rotavirus throughout the world is kind of low, don't you think? Harder. The Rotorix vaccine is a two-dose vaccine, which I think two. is an advantage for that vaccine as compared to right. the Rototech, which is three doses. But yeah, but it's getting out there. I, I think, you know, it's, it's given by mouth, which makes makes it a lot easier. Oh, to, yeah, sure, it doesn't sure. require that kind of paramedical personnel to, to help give the vaccine. Maybe it's, I should rephrase it. Do you see a time when there won't be any rotavirus yeah. out there? <laughs> yes. Um, I see a time when there'll be much, even much less rotavirus. Because, <laughs> because, well, I think we'll okay. replace wild type virus with, uh, with vaccine virus. Are there, are there, are there, there any, uh, have a, um, a reservoir host yeah, right. other than humans? Can I ask that? Well, every, every I think, uh, uh, species that walks the face of this plane, including not just mammalian species, but avian species, have their own strains of rotavirus. Right. Right? We, and, and their species barriers are high. So whereas a, a bovine strain will make calf sick, it doesn't make baby sick, and vice versa, which is really the strategy we use to make the vaccine, which is a generian approach, right? Mm. Uh, you know, we use a cow virus to protect against human... Uh, <laughs> Yes, Mr. Jenner. <laughs> right. So there's, so there's not, so it is theoretically possible that this could be eradicated, that it won't. I think so. I think that's right. It's, it's, a, it's a vaccine that, that does a very good job of preventing moderate to severe disease. There is still asymptomatic shedding, um, even in those who are vaccinated, but certainly okay. enough to, to dramatically reduce the incidence of the disease. And the, in, in the attenuated virus vaccine, is there any revertance back to wild type? No, no, no. That's good. good, good so yeah. it's like the like the oral polio vaccine, but without the revertent problem. Yeah, well, that's why I asked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and you could pattern an eradication campaign on that, but maybe actually have it work. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a weird. It's a double stranded RNA virus, right. double stranded segmented RNA virus. It's not like uh -huh. a single strand. Uh -huh. So uh, we have eradicated types one and three polio. I just got an email from the CDC. The other day, saying you have to destroy your type three polio. Uh, are you uh, types two and three are eradicated? Sorry, I think I said types one. Are you, th are you pretty optimistic about eradicating type one? There's no reason we couldn't do it. The problem is, you know, the wars that are, you know, and the those are reasons we right. couldn't. 
it's really just in Afghan. It's 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 endemic still in, in Afghanistan and yeah. Pakistan. I mean, you, you we've eliminated from Nigeria now, at least as an endemic disease. And it's certainly possible to do that. I, I, I'm looking forward to when we get away from the oral polio vaccine entirely, because as you say, it reverts to at least neurovirulent yeah. virus, and that's we've been suffering that ever since. We have to get it out of the water supply. You know, just get just get back to the inactivated vaccine. Yeah, I mean, in fact, even though uh, we have eradicated wild type two, there's still vaccine type two circulating. <laughs> so we have to stop. Yeah, we have to transition. So you said it took 26 years to develop the rotavirus vaccine, right? Uh, right. Is, about, is that about the right, what it takes, or does it sometimes take longer, sometimes, and excluding the COVID vaccines? What, how long does it take? Yeah, so the average time I would say is about 15 years. Ours okay. was a little long, and the reason it was a little long was just the reason that uh, that Alan said, which is that uh, we had to climb the mountain of a previous problem. In other mm. words, that that indecision problem was a rare problem. So meaning one in you know 10, one in 30,000 people. So now you're not doing a, a 30,000 person trial to to disprove that kind of uh, problem. <laughs> you're doing a 70,000 infant study. So mm. so you know you and you know you had to to to, um, you know, to have enough in a susception in your placebo group in order to answer that. And sure. so, you, so initially it was a 40,000 person study that became a 50,000, 60,000. I'll never forget one moment at Merck when, uh, you know, we were going over the next round of things and, and one of the uh, statisticians stood up just sort of completely frustrated because we just didn't have enough in in the control group and said, you know, it's hard to study something that doesn't happen. <laughs> That's one of the problems with the, with Sabin vaccine is that, if you wanted to improve it, I mean, the rate of vaccine associated polio is one in one and a half million. How do you test something you think might be better? And you can't. So they've decided we'll look at immune responses and so forth. And, and then, you know, they have approved a type two, a new type two OPV just based on shedding and immune responses. So, right. You know, you know, it's when people ask me who my hero is, I, do I have any heroes? The one hero I have actually is a guy named John Salamon. He was a guy whose son was given the oral polio vaccine who developed polio. And, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he thought, you know, I, I'm looking at Scandinavian countries that are giving the inactivated polio vaccine. They're eliminating polio in that country. I, I just gave my son an oral polio vaccine. I didn't even know that vaccine associated paralytic polio was a problem. I, that, that I was never informed about that. And so I was, I was on the, advisory committee for immunization practices at the time. And I asked him, and I was the head of the polio working group. I asked him to come onto that committee so he could put a face to that problem. And he was always respectful. I mean, he, to me, was a true vaccine safety activist. When these sort of anti-vaccine activists always say they're vaccine safety activists, they're not because they're, they're arguing for things that aren't really vaccine problems. Mm -hmm. But he was, and he was just very steady and very even and kind. And his son ultimately died of, of uh, you know, from complications associated with polio. And mm -hmm. I, I just, he was, he was one of those, those yeah. gentle heroes that really stood up for a vaccine safety issue. The um, other serious childhood illness, respiratory syncytial disease, right? That vaccine, they had a vaccine in the 60s that failed and we're still trying to get over that, right? Right. I mean, that was a painful lesson. It, it was really the, the, the problem was, so there were, this was, you know, grow up RSV, purify it and kill it with formaldehyde. Mm -hmm. And that uh, altered that fusion protein enough so that you had essentially this like antibody dependent enhancement problem, um, which was also seen with a killed measles vaccine, both of which mm, uh, right. were short lived for the same reason. Right. So now we have a, several COVID-19 vaccines developed in less than a year. What made that possible? Money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, we spent $24 billion on, you know, moving those vaccines forward. I mean, Operation Warp Speed and all the science that surrounded that. I mean, you know, you have to give credit to, to that. I mean, it, it, and, and, you know, it's, it's obviously this is a worldwide pandemic. It's brought us to our knees. And so there were 180, um, you know, research laboratories that were working on this and 100 companies that were working on this. I mean, that's not the usual story for making a vaccine. So there was such a desperate desire to do this. It is remarkable. I think if you asked 100 scientists back in January of 2020, when the, the sequence of that virus was published in Science, do you think within 11 months that we we're going to have two clinical trials of 30,000, 44,000 people using a novel technology, mRNA, with which we have no commercial experience, and we're going to find 95% efficacy across all age groups, across all comorbidities, uh, with a vaccine that apparently is safe? I think no one would have thought that was possible. So it is. No. 
a remarkable story. Well, yeah, you, can include, two, you can include, cl include me as no one. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we yeah. talked about this on TWIV. Like, how long is it going to take to make a vaccine? <laughs> I, I don't think anybody. I don't think anybody had eleven months. Um, and and the other the other thing that's kind of mind blowing. Some in a talk that I was um, virtually attending a little while ago, somebody pointed out that this has got to be one of the greatest replications in the history of medical science that two companies working independently with the same platform technology, but their own twist on it, came up with two vaccines against the same antigen and went all the way through phase three clinical trials, these huge trials, and got virtually identical efficacy results. It's really amazing. Right, and different molecules. I mean, different they're, both, mo right. they're different molecules. I mean, it's, you know, one developed at Biontech, the other developed at NIH, right. I mean, given at different doses. Yeah. So the um, they they did something different with the phase one, two, three, also, right? They were compressed. Yes. No, that's right. That that's the other thing that doesn't happen is that they did dose ranging studies, which you would normally do, and the way that you would normally do it, you know, twenty to one hundred people, make sure you have the right dose, right dosing interval, so that you're inducing an immune response that you think is associated with production. And then they pretty much went to phase three, which was paid for. I mean, at least Moderna's phase three trial was paid for. Or Pfizer paid for their own phase three trial. And while they were doing a phase three trial, which also never happens, you know, the the, the government was mass producing those vaccines at risk, not knowing yeah. whether it was safe, not knowing whether it was effective, willing to throw away millions of doses, that also doesn't happen. Yeah, so with, so with a stepwise process and you go, to the, you go to the board after each step and present them and do we continue? Yeah. Yes, so, so you mentioned sort of all of these events that I think no one, myself included, uh, would have expected would happen in 11 months that we'd have such an effective vaccine with a new technology and on and on and on. And because of those things, I think sometimes people have been asking a lot of questions about whether um, this was, you know, safe and whether this was a legitimate timeline. And so what types of answers do you have to those kinds of questions that people ask about, wasn't this rushed? Isn't this vaccine not safe because of this rush? Yeah, and the language that surrounded it was a little scary, right? Warp speed, race for a vaccine, who's going to be the first cross mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so on the FDA advisory committee, um, when we, we get a vaccine that's submitted, usually it's, it's as a biological, biologics license application, and then we license the product. We don't license the product. The typical length of time, by the way, it takes to do that is on average about 10 months. That's the usual story. So this wasn't done that way. It was, it was done through emergency use authorization. So what's the difference? The difference isn't the size of the trials. The, you know, the 30,000 trial by person trial by Moderna or 44,000 by, by, uh, by Pfizer was, was a typically sized trial for any pediatric or adult vaccine. The HPV vaccine was a 30,000 person trial. The conjugate pneumococcal vaccine was a 35,000 person trial. So it wasn't size of the trial. And it really wasn't safety follow-up. I mean, you, you know, if you look at sort of the history of serious side effects from vaccines, they invariably appear within six weeks of a dose. We, we've had this discussion with the CDC and, and, and we went through all of the ones we could think of. Is there anything that didn't show up initially six weeks after a dose? No. So by, by the FDA standing up and saying, look, we want two months of safety follow-up after dose two, you had the kind of safety follow-up that would typically occur with a vaccine. The difference is, is length of follow-up for efficacy. I mean, when those vaccines were released, you could say they were 95% effective for three or four months. That would not get you a, a licensed product. Normally, you would you would want to test it for a few years to see how long it's effective. But you know, 450,000 people died last year. So, so you weren't going to do a two or three or four year trial to see whether how long it was effective. So that was the, if you would argue, risk you were taking. But I don't think that's much of a risk. I mean, I think it's likely to be effective for obviously much longer. Uh, with other vaccines, would you be able to get efficacy data that was uh, as robust as that for COVID in a normal situation? I mean, part of the deal here is there's a pandemic. So there are a lot of cases happening. That's right. Um, hard, right? I mean, the the um, the HPV trial for although thirty thousand person trial that was a seven year study. I mean, because you're looking to prevent so called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type two and three. I mean, you couldn't go all the way to cancer because then you'd have to spend twenty or twenty five years to do that study. Um, so you're right. It, it's uh, it's it's a chance, but but you're right. It, I mean, it's because of the deaths from COVID, um, and because it, in many ways this country was on fire with COVID, you could do those kinds of studies more easily. Rotavirus was the same thing. I mean, nobody gets to age five in this country without being infected with rotavirus. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter the level of sanitation in the home or hygiene in the country, whatever, everybody gets infected. So those were actually pretty easy trials to do. 
So your answer before um, was incredibly helpful. And I plan to uh, quote you on that um, (laughs) next time someone asks me. Um, So you mentioned that we really don't see long-term effects after six weeks. Um, Is is that true for all vaccines? You know, are there many long-term effects and is that a legitimate fear that people, some people have? There are effects, there are effects that can last for a long time, but invariably they are picked up. So for example, narcolepsy, um, which is arguably a, a, a problem with that squalene adjuvant flu vaccine pandemics that was in uh, use in Europe in 2009. Right. You know, that, so that's one problem. So you could say uh, viscerotropic disease, you know, associated with the yellow fever vaccine, uh, polio caused by the oral polio vaccine, um, thrombocytopenia caused by measles containing vaccine. I mean, those, those sorts of side effects, which are severe, obviously allergic reactions that can be severe and, and, and truly harmful, usually occur within six weeks of a dose. Um, so there are actually nothing that happens after that, say, two or three month period, because many people have been asking this. What about long term effects? And I can't really tell them what long term, except for maybe Guillain-Barre, right? Even that. I mean, I'm sorry I didn't mention Guillain-Barre associated with, with flu vaccine, which is a roughly one in a million, occasionally a one in a million phenomenon. Mm-hmm. But knowing that, that Guillain-Barre syndrome also occurs after wild type influenza infection, at roughly 17 times greater rate. So you could argue that the flu vaccine actually prevents Guillain-Barre syndrome. <laughs> but, you know, but usually that does, that does appear within six weeks of a dose, too. That's another example. Okay. But you're right. That's what everybody says. How do you know, you know that, 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 that 30 years from now it's not going to be a problem? I just don't know what, what an example of that is. Good, good. That's good to know because I it's so I, helpful. That is very helpful. Yes, yeah. I, I say that. I'm actually, p- I'm going to be volunteering at my town's vaccine clinic, and and these types of questions are inevitably going to come up. Yeah. Um, now, I think you, you you touched on this, but tell us again the difference between an EUA and an approval. What does that entail? Right. So, so this, so normally it's licensure. Okay. You, you have a licensed product, and it may be that they that one or more of these companies will come back to the FDA and and submit a biological license application, which would mean they would have tested it for a longer period of time. That's essentially what Merck did with the Ebola vaccine. I mean, initially that was all through EUA, but then they came back years later and licensed it. Um, it's it's it, the, the only real difference it, it, functionally, as far as people should care about, is length of study regarding efficacy. That's really efficacy. The only okay. Need study. You know, the thing about the FDA's reviews, uh, you know, we'll get we will for the February twenty sixth meeting when we'll review the one dose J and J vaccine. You know, we'll get an eighty to hundred page document from the company that that it, it lists all the data regarding their their each phase of their trials, and then we'll get another hundred page document from the FDA where they go through each of the clinical you know the uh, portfolios to. to make sure that the company is is being accurate about what happened. That's all put on their website, which anybody can read. And then, you know, our meeting is actually open to the public. So it's it's, it's a transparent process, which I think is is good. It's boring, but it is transparent. (laughs) So uh, with respect to uh, this issue of the longer period of time to licensure, one of the questions that uh, is commonly asked about these vaccines is durability. Uh, whether the immunity, the induced immunity will last a long time. And I would assume that with a longer study with an aim towards licensure, those questions will be addressed, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I, I think the, the so-called the difference between efficacy studies, which is what you see in this case, pre-approval and effectiveness studies, because okay. those are two very different things, especially for a vaccine like Pfizer's vaccine, you know, which has storage and handling uh, uh, challenges. You know, we're trying to ship and store at minus 70 degrees. You know, now you're in retail pharmacies. I mean, how is that going to work out? You know, you have a, a vaccine which once thought has a five-day uh, life in the refrigerator. And then once that, that stopper is violated, because it's a multi-dose file, you have six hours. It's interesting. I don't think anybody really understands well why both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine, see if anybody on this panel knows this, why is it that both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine, once you violate the rubber stopper and give the first dose, only have a six-hour life before you have to throw it away. Do you know why that is? Most people no. don't know this. No. 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 It's, it's because they don't contain a preservative. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, I mean, how many multi-dose products don't contain Got it. a preservative? Okay. So, so every time you get the ninth or 10th dose, you know, you may have inadvertently introduced bacteria, right. um, which can cause a problem. So could you elaborate again on the difference between uh, efficacy and effectiveness? I think I use the words interchangeably. I think we all do. <laughs> Here's what I would say. The, the, um, 
So efficacy is what you're doing in a highly controlled situation, you know, where, where mm-hmm. you know that when Pfizer gives, puts or Moderna puts that vaccine out there, they are they, every every site that is testing that vaccine knows exactly how to store it, exactly what the rules are and, and aren't going to. And it's, that's the most optimal way of doing all that. Once it gets into the real world, things happen. And, mm-hmm. and you know, so so it's the difference between what you what you find in a highly controlled situation versus a real world situation. OK, professional driver on closed course. Right. Yeah. When you say things happen, I'm a parasitologist, Paul, so I used a different word for that. <laughs> <laughs> so many people are, are upset about this. They say, you know, these vaccines are not approved. They have emergency use. So how, how, are you, how do you answer that? I think the way I try to answer it here, that, I mean, what is it that we really don't know that efficacy, okay. license, right. and I just think it's efficacy. And so I, I, you don't find many people thinking, I really wish we'd study for this for three or four years before we let people have it. I don't think yeah. anybody's pushing for Now, that. when do we expect, say, Moderna and Pfizer to have uh, an, a, a licensed product? When will that happen? I'm not sure that, that that may never happen. I mean, they would have to be willing to come back and do that, um, I see. you know, to, to go through all that, which is not a cheap process. We'll, we'll see. They, they may not, they may not have any financial interest in doing it that way. Okay. Well, which would be a particularly big deal for Pfizer, which fronted all of its own money to begin That's, with. I mean, they would have to know that they're, they're probably going to recoup most of that just in the, in the EUA. Yeah. Um, and they'd have to know that there's some reason to continue doing that. Uh, so along along the same line, this may be getting a little ahead of our conversation, but this is a conversation we've had in the past. Uh, do you foresee, knowing the vaccines and the disease, that this is a vaccine that we will have to maintain indefinitely? Or is this a stopgap until the virus equi- equilibrates with the population and then we let nature take its course? Okay, so so I'm I'm going to do something you should never do with this this particular virus, which is make a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I see you're recording this. Recording's <laughs> on. I <miss> it. <laughs> Here's what I would say. I, I think what's happened over the last few weeks is incredibly encouraging. I mean, it is mid February. This is virus is at its heart a winter respiratory virus. It's mm-hmm. spread by small droplets. And nonetheless, here in mid-February, you're seeing a decrease in cases, decrease in, in hospitalization, a decrease in deaths, which is consistent. Why? I think the answer is immunity. Uh, it, it's you, you, We now say that 27 million people in the United States have been infected. Uh, but those are just people who've been tested and found to be infected. I mean, a lot of people who have asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease don't get tested or people who want to get tested don't get tested. So the only way to really know how many people have been infected in this country is to do antibody surveillance studies, which were done in November before this vaccine came out. And the the the, the feeling was is that, that looking at those antibody surveillance studies, the case number is probably off by a factor of four. It's probably closer to 80 million plus people, that's that's 25% of the population who've already gotten natural infection and therefore are likely to be protected. It's certainly against moderate severe disease associated with re-exposure. That's 25% of the population. We put 40 million doses out there. Now, now some of those doses have gone to people who've already been infected, so you don't get to count them twice, but let's assume it's still 20% or so. So, you, so you're, that's another 10% of people who at least have gotten one dose, which provides you know, at least some immunity, although I would argue short-lived and incomplete, and you need two doses. I want to again emphasize this is a two-dose vaccine, but um, that's another 10%. Now you're 35%. Do I think it's possible that 35% is now starting to have an effect? Yes, I, I think that was really the story with polio in the 1950s, following the Cutter incident when people were scared of that vaccine. Um, once you got to about 40% immunization rate, you started to see a decline. And polio is at some level similar to this virus in that the contagious in- index is, is close. I mean, this, this contagious index is probably in the mid fives, I think, at this point. Um, but, you know, it's been, been talked about it being two, then three, now it's mid fives, but that's that's probably close to polio. And polio was primarily transmitted asymptomatically. Obviously, it's polio was just a summer disease and it was primarily children, but I think there are similarities there. So I think I think that's why. And if that's true, that's really good news because we're just putting more and more doses out there. The, there are two things that will change that. One is is a, a variant that is is truly resistant to the vaccine. And by that, I mean, do you start to see people who are either naturally infected or immunized with two doses of vaccine who nonetheless are getting hospitalized? If that's true, then a line has got has been crossed. That hasn't happened. 
happened. I mean, of all this of the data regarding the South, I mean, the UK strain is similar enough to this initial variant, the D614G strain. I mean, the ones that were initially ultimately left China and then swept across Europe into this country, the one that the vaccines were made against. I mean, the, the UK strain is similar enough. That's not a problem. It's the South African and Brazilian strain, which clearly are have enough mutations in that, you know, receptor binding domain and then terminal domain to have made a difference. But still, nobody seemed, I was just on an NIH active call um, a couple of days ago, and um, Peter Dull was on that call from Gates, and he said there is, there is no example for the thousands of, of, of examples that could be out there where anybody who has gotten a vaccine and then is, is, associated, is, is infected with the South African strain is hospitalized or killed. So that's good enough. Uh, that's what you want. You just want to keep people out of the hospital, out of the ICU, and out of the morgue. So, so the variant, if a variant comes along, however, that does cross that line, that, that, that's different. Also, the anti-vaccine movement. That, that is another thing that could affect our ability to get adequate herd immunity. So you, you mentioned the, the difference between the EUA and the approval b- largely being about length of efficacy um, that we know. Is, is that something that we would, that kind of data that we're going to have to understand whether we need to give a boost in a year or longer out and how long we're going to actually have protection with this vaccine? Yes, I, I think those that those data. The CDC certainly is interested in generating those data, effectiveness data. I, I'm encouraged though by that 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 second dose can induce. And you guys have had better immunologists than me certainly on, on this program. But that that the, like like Shane Crowdy and stuff wasn't hasn't he been on this? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, he, he's, I mean, he's the one to ask this question to, but it does look like you can induce immunological memory with that second dose, you know, the T helper cell and cytotox T cell memory. So, um, so I'm optimistic. I mean, certainly studies done in the nineties, looking at human coronaviruses, human challenge studies with human coronaviruses showed that immunity lasted at least a year. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to predict again, stupidly, because this is being recorded <laughs> it would last, you know, at least a couple years. So, but if it fades, you know, you, you give a booster dose, we'll see. Well, and I guess there's also- also a possibility that, um, I mean, if we've got effective vaccines that are keeping people out of the hospital, keeping them from getting very sick, and even when reinfected, um, then the booster may simply be that you get the virus again, like we do with common cold coronas, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, and that's, it's okay if you get mild disease. I know you wouldn't prefer to have any disease, but right. you're just yeah. trying to keep yeah. people out of the hospital and keep them from dying. And if this, if this vaccine can do that, you win. And and with the J&J vaccine, and we'll see, I'm not supposed to make any predictions because we're, we're actually have to sign a form that we can't say anything about what we think of the, the vaccine before we review it. <laughs> it's like being on a jury, right? Right. Let's, let's assume that, that it, it's possible theoretically that that product gets out there. I mean, you know, that that vaccine, at least when it was tested in South Africa, although it was only 57 percent effective at my, presenting preventing moderate to severe disease compared to 72 percent in U.S., it's still in hospitalization and death in, 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 a, in a country where the South African strain is predominant. Right. Do you have any sense for what's going on in South America where Apparently, they have 78% seropositive, and yet they're having another big wave. Is that the 20, 22% of the people that aren't seropositive that are getting infected? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, the, 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 these viruses, as they adapt, and obviously the variants are going to continue to happen, they, they generally get a little more, as they as this bad coronavirus gets more adapted to the human population, it seems yeah. that, that it gets more contagious. Okay. Sorry, so Brian. You- go ahead. That's okay. You've mentioned um, this idea of people being able to get infected after vac- after having the vaccine and the vaccine protecting against severe disease. Um, and so we're sort of implying that this vaccine doesn't result in sterilizing immunity. Um, and I think we've had conversations about this a bunch of times before. Um, can you get herd immunity um, if sterilizing immunity does not happen? And what do we know about other vaccines and if they really induce sterilizing immunity or not? I mean, how many vaccines can do sterilizing immunity? Measles. Okay. Measles. Does it? It actually does that. Um, and two doses of measles vaccine induces lifelong protection, 97% chance of lifelong protection. And, it's, and a single, in fact, I mean, I'm of an age where I had measles as a child. Um, I'm protected for the rest of my life against all manner of measles disease. True. And 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 measles shedding. That virus just bounces off me. If I come <laughs> Um, but that's not most vaccines. Nonetheless, you're able to get it. I mean, a lot of these vaccines don't prevent asymptomatic shedding. Rotavirus vaccine doesn't really do that. The, the conjugate pneumococcal vaccine doesn't do that. The, certainly the pertussis vaccine doesn't do that. The influenza vaccine doesn't do that. But you what can about say, hepatitis B? Um, hepatitis B in terms of sterilizing immunity. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It might actually do sterilizing immunity. Because you, you do, okay. Right. 
But see, the, and the reason you can do that, it's easier to do that with long incubation period diseases. I mean, that's uh, it yeah, has weeks. I mean, when you're looking at like rotavirus and flu, their incubation periods are just a few days. So, you know, so you, you the immunological memory will kick in about, you know, three to five days after exposure. So you can modify the disease, but you, you don't really eliminate it. Did you mention uh, HPV vaccine in terms of sterilizing? Yeah, that, that probably, it, 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 at least for the goal of, of preventing cancer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, influenza vaccines, they're probably not sterilizing, right? No. The influenza, I mean, you think the influenza vaccine is about 50 to 60% effective. Yeah. Uh, and for older people, it's not particularly effective at all. So, so we, we could very well end up in a situation where um, people who have been vaccinated or been infected with SARS-CoV-2 um, are protected from developing symptoms but are capable of acting as shedders, at which point the concept of herd immunity doesn't really protect people who are not vaccinated or previously exposed. Although I would, pre I think you're, it, it may not protect against asymptomatic shedding, but I would predict, and we'll find this out, I think, soon, in those who are in not in immunized, that you would shed less virus. Okay. I think that would be the likelihood. Right. You think you would shed uh, less so as not to transmit? Good question. Good question. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, so it, is herd immunity possible? Yes. Oh, can we achieve herd immunity? Well, it depends how you define herd immunity. If you define herd immunity as completely eliminating this virus in this country, no. If you define it as being able to get to the point where we can you know, live with the, the degree of, uh, of cases and hospitalizations and deaths. We'll see. I mean, what's interesting is that, I mean, flu, flu this year is like gone. I mean, yeah. we, you know, last year, typically with flu, between 150 and 200 children die every year of flu. Okay, this year, at last I looked on the CDC data, was one. One child has died. I mean, there's something to be said for masking and social distancing, <laughs> preventing all manner of respiratory illness. I mean, you wonder coming out of this whether the lesson will be, Maybe we should do what people do in Japan or South Korea, which is wear masks over the winter months. I mean, I don't think we're going to do that. I mean, well, now that we all have these cool masks, we ought to, you know, get some use out of them after this. I'm yeah. really glad. I'm really glad to hear a uh, nuanced definition of herd immunity, uh, which I think I've been sort of doing with uh, a lot of uncertainty myself, uh, because I think people get into. Uh, semantic arguments, okay, that get uh, pretty pretty horrible about whether or not it'll cause herd immunity, and and I think having a more nuanced definition helps deal with that. I think we're already starting to see it. I think we're already starting to see evidence of herd immunity. With but this. if the yeah, so the the concerns that do come up if we're getting to the point of just living with this virus and it's never going to be gone, you know, we're not we're not on an eradication path here. Um, the two concern, the, the one concern that I have and the one rather cynical observation I have is first the concern, which is that especially in countries that are have, going to have a much harder time vaccinating their whole population or any significant portion of it, um, the virus is going to be much harder for them to control and the casualties are going to be much higher. Um, and that's not something that I expect any of us to have any ready solutions for because the you know, the Gates Foundation and others have been pouring billions of dollars into the basis of that problem for many years. Um, but that's that's the concern. And then the the kind of cynical observation is, you know, maybe this is how we get rid of the anti-vaxxers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, what's interesting is, is that um, it's such an important point. You know, you're only as strong as your weakest country out there. Uh, you know, it, why do we still have a polio vaccine in the United States? We haven't had wild type polio in this country since the 70s. We give it because it's still occurring in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We give it because it's very possible that somebody could fly into LAX with a Guardia who's, who's asymptomatically shedding polio. That's why we give it. If we let our guard down, we could see what the polio could come back as possible. So, so you're only as strong as your weakest country. I mean, I think when the, the last administration chose to sort of back away from the WHO consortium, that was short-sighted and stupid. This is not an, I mean, how much more information do we need that what happens in one country can affect the world? Uh, sh speaking of short-sighted, I wonder if you could tell us, how, why has it been so difficult to distribute vaccines in the U.S., say, where we've had some problems? Well, I mean, we're, we're not, the, the public health system, I think, in the U.S. is not geared toward mass immuniz immunization of adults. I, it, it's, we are getting there. I mean, you, you saw, initially, I think, so there, there's three problems, right? Mass production, mass distribution, mass administration. Initially, the focus was on administration because we had, you know, 20% of the doses that were distributed were administered. And then, then it became 30, then 40, then 50, now 60. It's, it's even like two thirds now. Um, so we're getting better at mass administering. But now you have all these sort of mass administration sites that are saying, 
you know, that are stopping because they don't have vaccine. So now I think it's a production problem. But it does sound like that Biden just today, you know, said that, that he hopes to have 600 million doses that we can distribute at least by September, you know, enough to vaccinate in theory 300 million people. That's great. Well, and that's without the without any additional vaccines getting approvals. I think was his. That, that's right. That's Moderna. His Pfizer. projection was just with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Right. So presumably, if if others come online, that would get better, right? Would happen sure. sooner. Yeah. Right. And J and J and all. I mean, who knows? I guess we'll see what happens at the committee meeting. But you know, you have J and J, and then you also have the AstraZeneca and uh, Novartis vaccines. Oh, sorry, uh, Nova Nova Novavax Novavax vaccines. Sorry, I keep saying Novavax. The Novavax vaccines, which are also presumably around the corner. Yeah. Now is um, so I know J and J is on the cusp of sending their paperwork in, and well, or, or in the process of doing that. Um, have you heard anything about the Novavax vaccine? Because the results from their phase three looked great to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're in an age of science by press release, so so I, I know what you know, what we read. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> look, really curious to see the data. I mean, look, yeah, like exactly. Percent effective against moderate to severe, or no, I think moderate ninety percent effective against disease. Yeah, um, less effective against this was in South Africa anyway. Less effective against South African strain, but again, effective at preventing you know hospitalization and death. Yeah, America. right. Um, as a pediatrician, I want to ask you this. So, why did we start this? pandemic with this idea that children don't transmit when we do know for everything else they do. Right. Uh, you're right. Children can transmit the disease. I mean, it is true that children are generally infected less frequently and less severely. That That is true. I mean, we, you know, I work at Children's Hospital Philadelphia. I can tell you we are not nearly as overwhelmed by that this virus as the hospital, the University of Pennsylvania, which is our next door neighbor. Um, but, you know, but this virus does infect children and it, it uh, as many children, roughly as many children died last year of this virus has died of flu. And so if we can safely find a way to prevent this disease in children, I think we should. Right now, the studies are being, some, some in our hospital studies are being done down to 12 years of age. I think after that, they'll do studies down to six years of age. I'm not sure they're going to do studies uh, at, in children younger than that. But um, no, I think we could be vaccinating first graders by the end of uh, summer. So when will, be, will we be vaccinating the the twelve year olds? Do you think that's that's in process, right? In pro, and I think those studies they're, they're, you're not going to do efficacy studies because right. you know, the, the instance of d disease is not as common in the younger age group. So you're going to do basically immunobridging studies. We'll do three thousand people. Um, you know, do make sure you got the right dose, dosing interval that you're in, in consistently inducing what you think is going to be a protective response based on the adult studies, and that would it's more a little more like the flu model for. And so you don't know what, what the timeline looks like for those. Um, I know they've started the trials. And right. I know that one of the trials is 3,000 patient participants. Okay. Paul, why? My daughter is just very interested in that subject right now. She's uh, As is her 15, father. She's 15 years <laughs> old, and we're, we're both very interested in knowing when she can get vaccinated. So, Paul, why in general do we do clinical trials for, say, vaccines 18 and up? Why not younger? No, well, we, I mean, the, the rotavirus trial is in infants. I mean, in, in babies. Less All right. So let's kids. say the COVID vaccines, why were they 18 and up? Because of the incidence in, in younger kids? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 the so, so um, people less than 21 years of age make up 26% of the U.S. population and 0.08% of the deaths, uh, you know, for 92% for of the deaths are in people over 55, 40% of the deaths are in people in nursing home. We went at, we went at trying to save lives initially. Yeah. Cause many, many people ask me, is it going to be a problem in the fall if all the adults are immunized and none of the kids are? And I say, well, disease is pretty rare in kids, right? Yeah, it's, it's certainly, yes, yes. I mean, we, 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 see, we see unusual things in children, this so-called multi-system inflammatory mm -hmm. disease, which I it was kind of a combination between Kawasaki's disease and toxic shock syndrome. I've never seen anything like that. First of all, this virus, I mean, billed as a winter respiratory virus coming out of Wuhan, I mean, it causes this unusual disease in children. It, it you know, causes a loss of taste and smell. It, you know, it's been detected by some neuropathologists in the brain, presumably coming up through the the nose. It's, it's you know, it, 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 it causes you to make an immune response against your own, um, you know, the, the lining of your, uh, your blood vessels, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. um, because it's really doesn't, it doesn't really cause viremia that much. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, you can get strokes, heart attacks, liver disease, kidney disease, because you can affect the, you know, the cells that line blood vessels, which is presumably immunologically mediated. What respiratory viruses do this? This is just a really unusual, weird virus, which is why when we first started working with it, I'm thinking, okay, here you have this like 
difficult to characterize virus, which has this, has this unusual clinical and pathological characteristics, which you're now going to meet with this, a vaccine strategy with which we have no commercial experience, right? What could mm. possibly go wrong? And so you <laughs> wait for that, that other shoe to drop, and it just really hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Well, and the other the other weird thing is what respiratory virus doesn't spread like wildfire through kids? That's right. It just... <laughs> Yeah, that's why I asked you that, because I don't understand where all this came from, this idea. And I think it was partly politically motivated, actually, to get schools open, right? Right, right. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, I, I do think, um, yeah, I, I, I do, I, I sort of weighed in on this on CNN once just about how I, I do think schools, I, I agree with the CDC, that, that one, teachers are essential workers, two, that they don't need to be vaccinated before they go back to school. This is true of many essential workers who haven't been vaccinated but going back to work. And and um, we can do much to, to mitigate risk um, when in schools and just should try and do that. But, but you know, it's just, I, I live, you know, living in Philadelphia for, for many of these kids, first of all, young children don't do well with, uh, you know, with virtual learning too. For many kids in Philadelphia, it is the only decent meal they get during the day. I mean, child abuse is often <laughs> yes, recognized yes. In, in schools. It's, yeah, it's indeed. indeed. Well, and I think um, early on, I mean, I was, I was skeptical about the school reopening discussion, but acknowledged kind of my own privilege and you know because i work from home and already and before it was cool um that my daughter's an excellent student she's fine online she's old enough it's not really an issue um but all these there are all these issues but at the same time i think a lot of us myself included underestimated the degree to which schools were able to adapt and I've been I've been very impressed with the you know enforcement of distancing and masking and restructuring of the of the lunch. They've got kids sitting around in the in the gym instead of in the cafeteria, so that they're all spaced out and and all of this. And um, you know, it's the kind of thing that yeah, that would make a real difference in transmission. Even even if the kids could get it, they're just not close enough to each other. Yeah, the parochial schools in Philadelphia are open. It's just, but you know, they have more money, and it, right. I just. It, it, to mitigate risk requires more money and, and hopefully the yes. Biden administration is committed to that. So Paul, you uh, deal with the uh, anti-vax crowd a lot. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of questions about this, but one that's always on the top of my mind is I'm curious about the motivations involved in the anti-vax movement. And I, I understand that some people are, genuinely what we would call vaccine hesitant. They have legitimate concerns about safety and maybe even efficacy, I don't know. But there are others that it's really hard for me to believe that they don't know that they're peddling misinformation, okay? And I'm interested in your perspective on whether or not that's true and what the motivations are. So you're exactly right. I mean, I, I would divide the sort of anti-vaccine sentiment, if you will, in this country into two groups. One is the vaccine skeptic, which is reasonable. I mean, I think you should be skeptical of anything you put into your bodies, including vaccines. I think everybody that sits around the, the table at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee is a vaccine skeptic, right? Show me the data. I mean, when they did those studies in September, October, would you get a COVID-19 vaccine? My answer to that question was initially would be, no, <laughs> let me see the data first, then I'll tell you whether I'll get it. So I think that's fair. Um, you should wonder about how effective it is, how safe it is, how, how do we know it's safe? What, what measures have we put in place to make sure that it's safe? That's perfectly reasonable. And so when those people call me who, who have those kinds of questions, I think I can generally answer their questions and calm them down. And I'd say that's most people. That's like 85% of the calls I get are that group. But then there's the other group, the, the, um, the, what I would call the true anti-vaccine activist, which is, is a conspiracy theorist. I mean, they believe that vaccines hurt their child, they believe it. I, they do believe it. To them, the temporal association was real and there's no talking them out of it. And the only data they're going to believe are the data to support their point of view. I, I like, you know, the Neil deGrasse Tyson line is perfect. You know, I, you can't talk somebody, if, if someone doesn't use reason or logic to get to a conclusion, you're not going to be using able to use reason or logic to get them out of that conclusion. And I think that's true here too. I mean, the, the story that I tell, because it's true, it's my, you know, my wife's a private practicing pediatrician. She goes into the office on a weekend day a mother has a four-month-old on her lap. While my wife is throwing the vaccine into the syringe, the four-month-old has a seizure, goes on to have a permanent seizure disorder, and at five years of age is dead of a chronic neurological condition. If my wife had given that vaccine five minutes earlier, I don't think there are any amount of statistical data in the world that would have convinced that mother of anything other than the vaccine cause. We think I'm stupid. My child gets a vaccine. Five minutes later has this problem, and now is, has a chronic neurological condition. I know what I saw. And there's a real passion that comes with that, and it's 
it's hard to match that passion, I think, you know, with statistical information. So that's always what you're, you're going up against the emotional power of an anecdote with, with statistical information. So you, you have to, in some ways, counter it with, with, uh, with some emotion. I mean, you have to obviously always have the science, but frame the science in a compelling and passionate and compassionate way to let people know that a choice not to get a vaccine is not a risk-free choice. It's a choice to take a, a different and much more serious risk, arguably. And that's the message you try and get out there. But the, you know, the anti-vaccine movement was born of the first vaccine. The, the, there were the anti-vaccine leagues were created in association with the smallpox vaccine. There's this great cartoon by James Gilray, like in 1802, you, you know it, you know, where there's this, this interested Edward Jenner giving a vaccine and then around him, everybody's looking askance because, because they're developing snouts and floppy ears and tails. I mean, that was like the internet, 1802. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and there's a there is a third category that I'm certain you're aware of because I've read your books um, of of people who didn't have a child with this, uh, who do actually know on some level that they're peddling nonsense um, and, and are, in fact, uh, doing quite well, often financially by peddling that nonsense. Sure. I mean, the Joe Mercola's of the world. I think, you know, you look at these websites, you know, they sell cures for autism. It's a cottage industry of false hope. And, and it's, it is this disgusting. I mean, to take advantage of a, a parent's desperation to try and, and treat their child um, it, it is to me the, the lowest form of humanity. And they're, they're, they're pretty mean. I mean, they don't seem to like me much. I am just sort of reading between the lines when they, they, you know, say that I'm like, Satan and, and a Nazi, just sort of reading between the lines. <laughs> um, and, you know, I just get the occasional death threat, you know, physical harassment. So, so and they, they were the worst, though, I mean, you forget me, but, but, you know, there are parents, for example, whose children die of a vaccine preventable disease who then become activists for, for explaining why a disease is bad and how you can get a vaccine. They attack them, too. It's just terrible. So uh, can you give me some uh, feeling for what the impact of uh, either the anti-vax movement or vaccine hesitancy is on vaccination rates in general and and whether you whether that's going to be what your anticipation is about COVID in particular, whether there's a, a problem there, a specific, a, a, a particular problem. Yeah, I'm a little worried. I mean, people tell me, and it's true in our hospital too, that a significant percent or reasonable percentage, 20, 30 percent of people are, are making a choice not to get a vaccine. Um, and th these are healthcare workers. Um, so you can imagine what it's going to be like when it gets out there into the into the world. Um, you know, there are certain communities that I think are at higher risk. The, um, the African-American community, there was a study done. It's interesting. It was a study done asking um, people, would you definitely get a vaccine? Would you definitely not get a vaccine? Are you thinking about it? So the African-American community, there are 14% of the African-Americans asked that question, said they would definitely not get a vaccine. And so they, you know, the, you've seen people on television, on CNN, sort of African-American women sort of talking about that and talking about how you can influence that community. But there were a couple of women on TV last week. It was perfect because that, that study also asked the question of, you know, of Democrats and Republicans, you know, and so it's like, Two thirds of Democrats said they definitely would get a vaccine. I think it was only one third of Republicans said that they, they, uh, that they. No, I think that they definitely would get a vaccine. But but twenty five percent of Republicans said they definitely would not get a vaccine. And what what the all these women said on TV last week was, bring them on this show, right? Ask them <laughs> this. I mean, you see, sort of Rand Paul sitting in the gallery there, you know, without a mask on. This is like um, Republican denialism. So this uh, that's the other thing that occurs to me is that the anti-vax movement. Uh, in the past, you know, decade or maybe even less, has become politicized. Uh, and I, what what's going on there? Why is that? Yeah, I, I don't. I think that it's on both sides. I mean, on sort of the Republican side, it tends to be a government off my back. Don't don't man. I mean, sort of that's Rand Paul's point of view when he's been in many ways anti-vaccine and things he said, you know, just just let me make a decision for my child. Don't mandate the vaccine, which is fine. I mean, I have no problem with the libertarian point of view. The problem is where you get your information, because if you're getting your information from the Internet, which is wrong, which can be wrong, and you make a bad decision and you put your child in risk, then, then that's where the libertarian argument falls apart. And that's why th that's why occasionally the state does need to step in and protect children. I mean, if from what are uh, ill-conceived acts by their parents. The the other side is this one, the Democrats on the left side, it's more like, you know, um, you know, sort of um, all things natural, you know, I don't want to put anything into my child's body. That's the whole not, foods crowd. Yeah. The whole foods crowd. The, the <laughs> free, free, dolphin free crowd. Right. That's it. Yeah. All right. Paul, we're going to let you go. I have one more question though. What's the one lesson we should take away from this pandemic? Um, that we need to make sure 
we don't go through this again. And, and, and the way we can make sure that we don't go through this again is to have an international surveillance system that, that the minute this kind of virus pops up, we are ready. I mean, we shouldn't have had to have depended on a whistleblower in Wuhan to tell us that there was a virus that was killing people. And I think that we also have to have surveillance systems regarding sequencing, you know, with regarding mass production of, you know, not surveillance systems, but regarding, we have to have in place, you know, the sequencing at an international level to, to make sure when these variants pop up, we can, we can figure them out. And then to production of things like masks and personal protective equipment and ventilators. And to do that at an international level, because because every you're only as strong as your weakest country out there. Hopefully, this has been a lesson learned. I, I, you know, it's it's unless you're 130 years old, you've never really experienced anything like this, unless you experienced the 1918, 1919 flu pandemic. So um, I, I, I'd like to think we learned this lesson. God knows it's been a painful one. Yeah. Paul off at University of Pennsylvania. This was terrific. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for asking me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. This was amazing. Bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. Take care. For asking me. All right. We got our questions answered. That was great. Wow. Just, that was so chills. Good. Just remember I, the answers so that you can tell people, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Hello, hello to all of the people I recommend this episode to and tell that they yes. absolutely must listen. Yes. Yeah. Twiv Twiv seven twenty. That's the. It's a good number. Boy, he's a uh, he's a pistol. He he's is. Good. I, yeah. He's going a mile a minute, and it all makes sense. Yeah. He's yeah. he's talked about this before. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> so once or twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that helps a lot. But he's uh, uh, actually, I was looking up. Um, uh, we good. should put in the show notes. Hang on, my I've lost my uh, mouse here. Oh, here we go. Uh, his. Uh, Vaccine Education Center. Okay. Yes. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah, that should be I with. Can, I can put the, I, if you like, I can put the link in the. Yes, please. Uh, Maybe with our picks or with show links or whatever. Uh, yeah, okay. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'll put it down under my pick. All right. Okay, so at least the link is there. All right, let's do some uh, email here. So uh, this first one um, is, I have two from um, what I think are either Russians or people in Russia. Well, one is from Vienna, Sebastian in Vienna, and then Liuba. And so Sebastian gives us some Cyrillic uh, or Sputnik Vak, V-A-K-T-S-I-N-A, -S short Sputnik V. All right, so he has the Cyrillic for both. Um, and then Liuba said, I want to clarify regarding Sputnik V. V in this context is not a Roman number. It's a first letter of victory or vaccine. Okay. Okay. We keep saying five, right? <laughs> well, because there was there was a Sputnik that Russia produced uh, quite notably a number of years ago that was not a vaccine, although it did have kind of a viral look to it. Yes, it did. So that's V for victory or so Sputnik Vaktsina. Sputnik V. There you go. Thank you. Thank you're probably really butchering that. Not that I could do any better. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I, I butcher many things. My apologies. But uh, th if you want the Cyrillic, go look at the show notes. Uh, Dixon, can you take the, the next one? You're muted, Dixon. Dixon, Dixon, Dixon. Muted. I said, yes, I can. As soon as I get this damn thing. Um, <laughs> <thing> here. <laughs> So you want me to read Dagfin writes. Dagfin, right? yeah. Dear Twivers, greetings from a sunny and freezing cold morning in Oslo, Norway, where it's uh, minus 9.5 centigrade. That's very cold. That's what it was here this morning, Dixon. That's cold. Yeah. I thought it was cold here too, Vincent. While watching Twiv 709, I noticed you enjoyed Agat Hawk poetry and that someone had posted an alternate version of Mr. Sandman. In an inspired moment, I took the liberty of making my own version, which is enclosed. Note, especially the third verse. And please excuse my licentia poetica. Actually, many years ago, I was a musician. I tried to have some of my old friends in a barbershop group record this for you. Are you listening, Rich? But unfortunately, they are not allowed to meet during the lockdown. Sorry about that. Here's my shot at Mr. Sandman. <clears throat> Mr. Labman, bring me a gene that makes a brilliant new protein 
make it express a brand new receptor that functions like a SARS-CoV-2 deceptor. Lab man, make a vaccine, make it effective so I can have dreams, so I can dream of great immunoglobuline. Mr. Lab man, make a vaccine. <laughs> Mr. Lab man, your protein will have a brain, that's poetic license, by the way, and it will make, uh, will have a binding site like the world's never seen to make the spike bind tight and be less useless than make our sterilizing efforts ruthless. Lab man, virus are prone to be degraded in a lysosome. So synthesize mRNA that will make disease go away. Mr. Lab man, make the vaccine so good to spindler and condit and the team adverse effects be minute and mellow. So twivs still come from Vincent Racaniello. <laughs> Lab man, it would be great to be immunized before it's too late. So please turn on that magic gene. Mr. Lab man, make a vaccine. Wow. <laughs> All right, Dixon. Finishing Dixon. strong. Nice. Good. Only, Good. only at the end you start singing, Dixon. <laughs> I mean, I have to, well, I wouldn't have dared do that. Dagfin no. <laughs> Rosness. Dagfin Rosness. Good luck pronouncing that. Well, I thought I did okay. Um... I'm Brilliant. Like I love it. I think that's terrific. Someone, If someone would like to record it, we would play it back for you. Yes. That is excellent. I already have the song in my head, and that would put it <laughs> yes. in my head even more. <laughs> I can see the, the, the bum, 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 bum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, this is the original Mr. Sandman. It's not the Metallica version, right? Right. right. Uh, no. Yes. No. <laughs> let's, let's hope not. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Bill writes, if the mRNA vaccines use the identical spike building piece of mRNA, in theory, they should create the identical injected antigen, except for any variation in the suspension material between the manufacturers. Is this true? Yes. <clears throat> there have been a few inadvertent cases where people received two doses from different manufacturers. Has there been any follow-up on the efficacy in the patient by any detailed analysis? I'm stopping here. Not that I'm aware of. Anybody Not else? Not that I'm aware of either. No. Not that I've seen. Uh, the the among other things, the, I think the incidents of that are pretty few. Yes, so far. Uh, so so far. Uh, going on, there are other methods via inactivated virus and also a virus vector. So a situation might arise with one mRNA dose and one inactivated or vector-based dose. The same question arises. Uh, yes, the same question arises. Yep. We'll come back to that. The Russian Sputnik vaccine is vector-based, but uses two different vectors for dose one and dose two, hopefully eliminating the risk that a ro robust response to dose one might not be capable of neutralizing the second dose before it is capable of eliciting its boosting effect. I see that few countries have adopted the Russian vaccine. Uh, Cold War memories may have dismissed this badly named vaccine in the minds of many, possibly with no proper basis except for this bias. Are we improperly tarring Russia with past prejudices? We'll come back to that. I'm going to finish this. Has there been any arm's length assessment of the efficacy of this Russian vaccine in the countries where it's mm -hmm. been adopted? How well did Russia make the billions of doses of assorted vaccines used for other diseases over the past 25 years or so since the USSR fell? So, uh, yeah, going back to uh, earlier mixing and matching vaccines, the uh, relevant antigen, regardless of whether it's going to be a vectored vaccine or an mRNA vaccine, is the same. It's spike. With an inactivated vaccine, it's a little different because <clears throat> you're going to be administering not only spike but other viral structural proteins. So the immune response is not going to be exactly the same. In the vectored vaccines, you're probably also going to be making at least a limited immune response to some of the proteins from the vector itself, uh, whether they have any impact on the actual antigenicity of the vaccine itself, other than in boosting, uh, is an open question. I would assume that, you know, your response to spike is going to be pretty similar and that, uh, you know, in 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 reality, that mixing and matching these things is not uh, ultimately going to be an issue. However, 
you don't know that until you do the experiment and it's important to stick to the protocol. Okay. Yeah. Because so this, yeah, this is something that the, um, uh, the regulators have been looking at from the beginning. I mean, because they knew there were going to be multiple vaccines coming on market and people would be wanting to get whatever was available. Um, and so of course the initial trials were done one vaccine at a time. You got dose one of Moderna, you get dose two of Moderna. Um, there is now a lot of discussion going on about setting up trials to compare. One of the issues with that is the sheer number of vaccines that are either on the market or likely to be on it very soon. And so I count, uh, what, seven that are either approved or on the brink of approval. Um, that's just off the top of my head. We're probably going to have a dozen different vaccines in use within several months. So you'd have to do all of the pairwise combinations. Yeah. And what do you do with a vaccine that's single dose like J&J? &J? You know, if that was, if you got Pfizer's first and J&J's second, well, yeah. Yeah. you know, what does that mean? And what was the schedule to it? So these are going to be tricky to set up. And I don't know if anybody's actually going to end up getting around to doing them. But yeah. Pfizer, Moderna, though, CDC has said you could... Mix CDC those, has right? now said those two yeah. are, are mixable. Yeah, yeah, th those two seem seem to be um, how you know seem to have a lot of similarities, <laughs> um, and I think of those two vaccines as being quite similar. Um, in terms of kind of preclinical studies with other vaccines that have been under investigation, the idea of doing um, a heterologous prime and boost, and so using two different vaccine types or two different vaccine vectors, um, has often given very promising results. That has often been a good thing in preclinical trials. Um, and so I would be excited to see the data that Alan mentions, um, but I also would not want to um, start messing around with this until we see the data. Yeah. Brianne, if you're doing a, a, a heterologous prime boost with say, uh, you know, typically this has been done like a, uh, in the extreme, say a DNA vaccine uh, and a viral vectored vaccine. And the antigen is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from getting around vector immunity, is there any other particular advantage that you can, theoretical advantage that you can think of, of using uh, such heterologous platforms? Um, they could. So um, first I will say the data that I've seen on that indicates that there does seem to be a benefit. Um, if I were to sort of speculate, I might say that you are including some slightly different parts of the innate immune response. And so you're getting some, you know, icing on your cake um, in terms of inducing an immune response, but I'm not sure I have um, super in-depth data on that. But okay. note, it has not worked for HIV vaccines. They've done right. lots of prime boosts and yeah. nada. Yeah, you know, HIV is a Gordian knot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd have to you'd have to pick an example of a successful HIV, two successful HIV vaccines, and then compare prime boosts. And gosh, we wish we were in that position. Right. So, so these vaccines only only um, apply to two dose vaccination regimes. Yeah. Johnson and Johnson is a one vaccination right. regime. So that you could read that. So you got six now. You got actually four because you've got two that are the same. Right. So you said seven to begin with. So, well, right. So the ones so that Johnson Johnson see if I can, because it's a single dose. Right. No, this uh, is going to be combinations. Then, this is going to be like name the seven dwarfs. Right. What were the seven? Right. I was thinking. I, I thought of them. Um, well, I know we're so grumpy. Pfizer, is, so Pfizer, <laughs> Moderna, J and J, Novavax, AstraZeneca, um, Sinovac, Sinovac uh, and Sputnik. There, I got to say. And and do you know the ingredients in all of them? Mm -hmm. yeah. We've talked I about them all. Yeah. I think most of them I know the platform. Yep. So how many of them are the same? Uh, I just did this the other day. Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah, are that's the only Pfizer and Moderna are the yeah. same. Yeah, I think that's the only one that I would call the same. I mean, really? the, ad, the adenoviruses are all different adenoviruses, right? Well, yeah. I gotcha, I gotcha. Uh, so... Um, uh, Bill has uh, the other question about the uh, global uptake of the Sputnik vaccine. And uh, I, I think that that's uh, maybe gotten off to a slow start simply because, um, I mean, it started up in Russia early because they started administering that before they really completed 
uh, phase three trials or even started phase three trials. Um, and the phase three trials, I don't think have even been published yet. Correct. No, we just, uh, we, we talked did. about it on oh, last okay. week. Remember? <laughs> Was that phase three? Okay. Yeah. At any rate, I think it's been, yeah. uh, uh, it, uh, it's been, uh, delayed simply because uh, apparently delayed because Russia got an early start on it and others were waiting for the phase three data. So uh, um, in the paper, I don't we, know what, and I don't know what efficacy looks like in other countries. So in the, we did this paper last week and they said as of January 23rd, more than 2 million doses have been administered of uh, their vaccine in, in Russia. Yeah. So, um, I recall we also had talked about the Sputnik vaccine after one of its earlier trials. Yeah. Um, and we were a bit skeptical because of the size of the trial and some of the, the details of how it had been run. Um, and I felt like that paper we did recently looking at the phase yeah. three kind of changed my mind. And I was like, oh, OK, this is legit. Yeah. I'm, I'm good with this. And so sure. that that's my only thought in terms of, you know, improper tarring, um, as Bill said, is that perhaps the, those results at the beginning made people skeptical. But now that I've seen the data that have come out recently, it seems totally fine. But I think phase there was one, actually two, proper tarring phase, early on. Yeah, phase one, two with 70 people, they should yeah. be tarred. That's no good. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. That's, that's not the point at which you start distributing it to 2 million. No. Um, but that was kind of the Russian approach because Putin needed a political win, I think. Was hey, it's in the name, it. Russian. Yes, they were so, Russian. So uh, beyond that, uh, so we're talking about, there's two different issues here. One is the science and the other is the, the regulatory. The perception, yes. Okay. Um, and I have no reason to, uh, I have no reason a priori to doubt the Russian science. No, okay? no, no. Um, they're perfectly okay. I want to yeah. just mention that, you know, Albert Sabin developed his oral polio vaccine and the U.S. would not do a clinical trial because they said, we have Salk vaccine, we don't need your stinking vaccine. So he went to Russia and put it in millions and millions of kids. They did a proper clinical trial and it was shown to work and he brought it back and the U.S. licensed it. So they do good science. Yeah. 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 Which, I know I've, I have no problem with um, the Russian science. My problem with the Sputnik vaccine was that it was rolled out as far as I could tell ahead of the Russian science. And it would have been yeah, nice yeah. to see the phase three trials before they started rolling that out. Agreed. Um, I personally am very committed to the Moderna vaccine right now because I got shot number one on Tuesday. Um, very as good. a byproduct, I didn't realize it was going to happen. It was a byproduct of volunteering for the vaccine clinic. Uh, they said, okay, come in and get yours. Oh, okay. Uh, with, re uh, with respect to Russian science, I would remind people that for the past uh, 10 years or even more, we've been uh, completely reliant on the Russians to shuttle us back and forth from the <laughs> space station. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Uh, we're up to Mark, right? Yep. Uh, hello, Vinny and the Twivs. In several shows recently, Vincent has talked about New York City's vaccination against smallpox in 1947. It is still a world-class accomplishment. Four to five million people vaccinated in two weeks? Wow. Did you know that there's a film based on a film noir based on this? The title is The Killer That Stalked New York, which is a 1950 black and white movie that unites a treasury agent and an emergency doctor cast into doing good old fashioned shoe leather epidemiology. If I may borrow a recurring phrase from Twim's Michael Schmidt, who must locate a femme fatale who is smuggling diamonds and unknowingly spreading <laughs> smallpox in Manhattan. Uh, at the time of this email, this 90 minute movie may be viewed on YouTube provides the URL. My favorite line in the movie is, use everything short of a gun to get people vaccinated. <laughs> Stay healthy. Good luck with that's that. No, that's great. I like that. Thank you, Mark. Brianne. Sure. Pamela writes, hello, Team Twiv. Thank you for providing me with a reliable and entertaining source to turn to regarding all things COVID-19. As with many clinicians, that is all I have thought about for the last 11 months. I myself had many questions regarding the safety of the mRNA vaccines, but your explanation of the data and science reassured and convinced me that it is safe and effective and I should get it. Now I am doing my part to help educate our community. One question has come up as we have started learning more about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Part of our education regarding the mRNA vaccines has been to reassure families that the mRNA does not enter the nucleus, degrades quickly, and does not interact with our DNA. 
Now with the J&J vaccine, it is a DNA vaccine and does enter the nucleus. Can you please explain how the DNA vaccine works? And specifically, since it enters the nucleus and is DNA, does it interact with our human DNA? Also, how long does the viral DNA persist in our cells? Maybe you already have a show in the works discussing the J&J vaccine more in depth, or maybe I missed this somewhere. But I do listen to in snippets throughout my day, and it also took me a while to learn to realize that the Bluetooth on my phone was playing your show in my freezing cold car as it warmed up in the mornings. So I likely <laughs> missed 10 minute chunks from multiple episodes. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't let that happen anymore. Thanks for sharing your incredible knowledge with the world. Uh, and this is from Pam, um, who is a physician's assistant and says where the temperature is a toasty 12 degrees Fahrenheit today. Um, so Pam, uh, so you have referred to the J and J vaccine as a DNA vaccine. Um, just getting my uh, slight pedantry out of the way first. Um, so the J and J vaccine is a vaccine that is a vector based vaccine. Um, where the spike is encoded within an adenovirus. Um, you're right that that virus does have a DNA genome. And so we are delivering the DNA, but we're delivering it in an, a virus called an adenovirus. I say that because there are some other vaccines that are just straight DNA. Um, and so this is not a straight DNA vaccine. This is a vaccine where the DNA is in an adenovirus. When that DNA gets into your cell and goes into the nucleus, it remains separate from the genome um, as sort of a little circle. I believe it's episomal. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it stays episomal. It's not a as circle, a it's circle. Linear. linear. It's linear, okay. Yeah. Um, but it's basically another piece of DNA. Um, in some ways, you can think of it as its own little chromosome. Um, it's not really a chromosome because it doesn't have the right proteins, but... <laughs> Well, we can think of it as its own little chromosome. So it does not interact with your DNA. It is not included within your DNA. And it doesn't have um, the ability to um, get uh, reproduced when the cell is dividing. So it will not be copied and brought into a daughter cell. And as sort of free DNA, that's not part of your genome. It will eventually be degraded um, in your cells. I don't have a specific timing on that. Um, but if you'd like to come to my lab, that's related to my research. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I would point out is that, um, I mean, yes, very, very important point that this is a viral vector d vaccine. It's a DNA virus. It's a type of DNA virus, an adenovirus that we've all had before. Everybody gets adenoviruses. They spread widely. You had them as a common cold. They're respiratory viruses. They're, they're, all over the place. Um, Kathy would be the person to have on the show to talk <laughs> extent. She has, if you go back to past episodes, talked extensively about endoviruses. That's her thing. Um, but um, every time you get an infection with an adenovirus or any other um, DNA virus, its DNA goes into your cells and does this. And, and as Brianne was uh, initially saying there are some that form a little circle, like a little plasmid. This one happens to sit there as a little linear chromosome. Um, they don't go do anything but make more virus with that DNA. So that's what that viral vector is doing. In the case of the J&J &J vaccine, not only is it this common adenovirus type of thing going on, it's actually a crippled adenovirus that's had a piece of the, of the, SARS-CoV-2 virus put in, so it's going to express spike on the on the cell. Um, but as a result of that engineering process, it's also incapable of even functioning as an adenovirus. So not only is it no bigger threat to you than the other adenoviruses you've inhaled throughout your life, it's actually less because it can't even get out of the first cell and make an adenovirus. Uh, I'm also thinking now uh, I'm uh, posing this. This is not necessarily a known that there are going to be fundamentally two types of cells that take up this vector. One are going to be antigen presenting cells, which then ferry this thing to the, um, to a lymph node and do their job there. And ultimately Brianne, they're going to just go away. Right. Um, they, those cells are all cells that live for a short period of time, just in general. And in theory, the sort of, if a uh, T cell sees them, as it's second time seeing the antigen, that T cell is going to kill them. 
Right. Yeah. And so the other types of cells that are going to be, uh, that are going to take up this vector and express spike might be muscle cells or other t uh, tissues that are in the neighborhood. They're going to have the same problem ultimately, right? Because if they're expressing spike, uh, once you get the immune response uh, cranking, they're going to get killed. Right. Much the same as in a regular adenovirus infection. A lot of the cells that get infected ultimately get killed anyway. Yeah. And, uh, and, that's, and that's okay. And both of those things you've just said are true of the mRNA vaccines too. Yes. Um, you're going to have a few cells that are making spike and they're going to get killed. And then you're going to go on with your life, not making spike. <laughs> yeah. But rich yeah. muscle cell nuclei live a long time. Not if okay. they get killed. Not if they, yeah, not if they oh, get well, killed. Then you're going to kill off the muscle. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's why you get injection site pain. Wow. Well, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Rich, uh, what's your buddy... He says there are two kinds of vaccines. What are they? Nucleic acid and protein. What was his Graham, uh, uh, Grant? Grant. Grant. McFadden. Oh oh oh. Um, uh, so which is missing memory cells? Uh, yeah, I'm missing memory cells. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if we're talking about Grant. I I think of uh, I uh, kind of categorize these vaccines, and I've got a little presentation that I. Uh, put together for the lay public that describes all of these different platforms. But I think of this as the two different types as a protein that's made in the laboratory and then injected mm -hmm. on the one hand. And that would include both inactivated vaccines and protein-based vaccines. Or on the other hand, a vaccine where the antigen the protein that you're interested in is made after injection in you. Yeah. And that would include the vectored vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, attenuated uh, and vaccines, the live yeah. attenuated viruses. Yeah. So you could okay. think and I would think, I would think, uh, and Brianne has checked out here for a minute, but my, I make that distinction among other things, because I think the, the immune response to those two different, uh, types, either a preformed protein injected or a va or a protein that's made uh, after injection on site, that the immune response, the profile is uh, different. Okay, yes. that's one of the yes. reasons you adjuvant that's right. the vaccine with the with the yeah. preformed protein because a replicating virus causes inflammation, which right. is good for immune responses. So yes. you add an adjuvant to do that. So I'm unchecked out now. And um, so there's a difference in the adjuvant um, stimulating the innate immune response. There's also a difference in which part of the cell has that protein antigen um, and thus how it accesses MHC presentation. Mm. Um, and I, I've been getting some letters. Yes, I know I usually oversimplify MHC when I talk about it. Please here. continue it's oversimplifying. Fine. Yes. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it can change some aspects of MHC access, um, which can influence the response as well. Sure, sure. So I have a, I have a, I got to do this. I got a little aside here and I'm going to HIPAA violate my wife. Okay. Uh, because, uh, we got our first, uh, dose of Moderna two weeks ago. And both of us had mild inject, very mild injection site pain that went away. Uh, and then a week after that, uh, my wife got some itching and redness on her arm. She got the, the Moderna site. rash. Uh, you know, I emailed uh, 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 Daniel Griffin about this. And I sent him a picture and stuff. He said, wow, have you ever seen this? And he said, you don't listen to my clinical updates. No. <laughs> Lyme. Uh, yeah. That's right. I hope he didn't uh, say Lyme disease. He sent me back three pictures of exactly the same thing and said he's talked about this before. He calls it the seven-day itch. Yeah. All yeah. right. And this yeah. to me is... Okay, you get immunized, your antigen presenting cells carry this to your lymph nodes. They all go to school there. And then after a period of time, go back to the scene of the crime and yep. stir up all kinds of trouble uh, uh, cleaning up the mess. Fascinating. Yeah. It's just great. I'm going to show you a picture of it here in one second. Here we go. Seven day itch. And then, yes. Yeah, I Daniel. wrote back to Daniel. I said, color me chagrined. <laughs> I do days. listen to your clinical updates, but apparently not carefully. Okay, here we go. I think I'm going to crop this to get the person. Uh, so you can't really see the person, but I'm going to crop it nonetheless. And here is a seven-day itch. And um, 
Where did here we where did Zoom go? Okay, share my bloody screen. Can you uh, see that? Yep. And that is a seven day itch encircled by a a, yep. a marker. The yep. marker is not part of the seven day itch. <laughs> no, you don't get the outline with it. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Seven day itch. It's All pretty right. big. That, that could be mistaken for a Lyme disease if it were somewhere else on your body. <laughs> or even there from Adam. That's that's big. I, I didn't expect it to be that large. Dixon, can you move your boom up a little bit? Because it's scratching your it's beard. It's scratching your beard. Either that or trim your beard. Again. Trim your beard. <laughs> How's that? Okay. That's good. good. Yeah, uh, that's probably uh, let's better. do a couple more. Omar writes, hello, and thank you for your continued efforts to inform inquiring minds. I noticed the EUA for BAM lanivimab specifies the patient be within 10 days of symptom onset. Is BAM, lanimiv BAM lanivimab a bad idea for people with long COVID? I haven't found much on this topic and would like to benefit from your collective wisdom. What are the options for long COVID sufferers? BAM BAM is not useful for long COVID because if the virus is almost gone or nearly gone or completely gone by then, and you no longer have a virus problem, you have other issues that BAM BAM, which is an antiviral monoclonal antibody, is not going to solve. So it's not a bad idea. It's useless. Um, it's a waste of an injection and money and so forth. What are the options for long COVID? Not many at this point. That's the problem. Many people are interested in it. NIH is, uh, is telling people to work on it. Stay tuned. It's not going to be overnight. But I, I remind you that you know, the, the chronic fatigue syndromes, CFS slash ME uh, patients ha have all awakened and said, hey, I've been trying to tell you this for years. I had a virus <laughs> infection and then I got long something. And now, yes, yeah, this is bringing awareness to ME CFS, which is good because a lot of people are getting infected and a lot of people are getting long COVID. So maybe it will help both communities at some point. It's not good that a lot of people are getting long COVID, but it is good that attention is being brought to this aspect of, of what is probably a, a prolonged immune reaction. Right. Dixon de Pommier. Yes, sir. Hillary writes, dear TWIV team, thank you for all of the time you take. Thanks. Thank you for all of the time you are taking to review COVID-19 literature and answer questions. I have been an avid listener since February, and I will be long after this pandemic has resolved, whenever that may be. When listening to TWIV 715, I heard Rich comment that Johnson & Johnson made a choice to go with one shot versus two, like Moderna and Pfizer. I wonder if this was really a, a conscious choice or really that antibody mediated immunity clearing the adenovirus vector is going to prevent boosting to spike in a second shot. I haven't reviewed Johnson & Johnson's prior data, but I worked with development of AAV vectors for gene therapy for several years. And one of our primary concerns was pre-existing immunity to vector preventing delivery of the message in that case. Is it possible that a boost using the same vector was simply not possible? Sincerely, Hillary. Gentlemen? It's possible. You know, um, it's possible. I actually have some insight into this because I'm in contact with people at J&J &J, uh, through my connections in the Brighton collaboration. Uh, and I will confess that this is uh, what I'm going to say is simply a result of conversations with them, which I believe I have understood correctly. I'm qualifying. This is the scientist qualifying everything he's saying. Uh, and I have myself not looked at the data. Okay. But my understanding is this. Uh, first of all, that they use an adenovirus 26 vector. And for reasons that are not entirely clear, uh, vector immunity, either natural or induced by a vaccination, is not a big issue with a boost with that, okay? Number one. So the vector immunity problem doesn't seem to be a big deal with uh, ad 26. And that, uh, my my J&J &J friend uh, uh, summarized that by saying, uh, uh, I'd rather be lucky than good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, they've had a lot of experience with that vector in a lot of different situations. Uh, heterologous prime boost with an MVA uh, vector, uh, homologous prime boost with uh, ED26. Uh, and yes, you do get an effect of a boost. Okay. At least in terms of antibody. Okay. Uh, and 
So that's fact number two. Uh, fact number three is that they have uh, they are starting or in the process of trials where they are testing the effect of a boost with the adenovirus vaccine. Okay, so those are those are the facts. The rest you can make up for yourself and ask yourself why did they do their trial with a single dose? Okay, and my uh, hypothesis of that is that they knew from experience that they were very likely to get a good response with one dose, even if they could get maybe a better response or in the long run, a more durable response with a boost. But we're in a pandemic, folks, and being able to distribute this as one dose uh, could be uh, life-saving, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, conscious decision, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that was very much a business decision combined mm -hmm. with a scientific decision where they looked at the data from previous efforts and also the, their phase one and phase two data from this vaccine and said, you know, we're getting a pretty good antibody response with one dose. And wouldn't it be hot to have the only single dose COVID-19 vaccine on the market um, and it'd be effective? And so they did the trial on that basis. And yeah, it turns out it looks pretty good. And, and the thing is, you got to You got to make a choice. Yeah. In structuring a trial, you either right. do a one dose trial or a two dose trial. Well, so and you can you can get through a one dose trial faster. Uh, if you think it's going to work that way, you get a better product that only has to be delivered once. And, you know, in their case, it only has to be stored at refrigerator temperatures. And a quicker trial. And a quicker trial. Didn't exactly. we talk, That's what I meant. Uh, last week, we mentioned some company where they were they wanted to do one dose and they didn't get a good enough response. So they switched to two. I don't remember which one that was. But yeah, sometimes you want to do one, but it's not good enough in, say, your phase one trial. So you yeah. switched it to. Everybody would rather have a one-dose vaccine. And it's cheaper. I want a 10-dose. Yeah. I want to keep going back. <laughs> you and want to keep getting <laughs> <laughs> it's called the, Vincent, it's called the flu vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, Rich, you're next. Uh, am I on Karen here? Karen. Karen writes, hello, TWIV folks. I have sent a few missives to you over the past year. I had not realized how hooked I would become on y'all and how much I would learn. Uh, thank you for both, I think, wink. A short story about solid public health practices. My child lives in Thurston County in Washington State. They created a small pod of others who agreed to act responsibly and get together from time to time. Two Saturdays ago, the pod made a wonderful meal, drank some good beer, and played Settlers of Catan together. Uh, that's a that's a Settlers of Catan is definitely a super spreading uh, yes. uh, potential. <laughs> that is that uh, has been off my list for the entire length of the pandemic. <laughs> but, but yeah, I would love to get back to it. Two days later, a roommate of one of the pod members tested positive for COVID. Even though they did not have symptoms, they had known about a close encounter they had and had not taken precautions. Subsequently, this is what happened. One. The one who tested positive was moved into a COVID hotel free of charge until they are no longer contagious. They will stay there. Two, the roommate who did test positive has been asked to quarantine for N days. I assume 10 to 14 groceries are brought to the house and they are immediately given unemployment benefits. Three, the others who were secondary to the roommate have not been required to quarantine, but are asked to be more diligent and are being tested regularly. I do not live in a county state or for that uh, county or state for that matter that has taken SARS-CoV-2 transmission as seriously. I am thrilled my child lives in mm. such a county state slash state. Thought you might appreciate a story of a place with solid public health measures. Finally, Dixon and Vincent should know that this child adored finding and listening to This Week in Parasitism. They are working in ego agriculture. They are very PNW, that's Pacific Northwest, type of work and will soon be headed back uh, to do additional graduate work. Could be parasites will be in their future. Karen, what a nice story. Cool. That's great. Glad to hear. Wa Washington is a good state. Remember, yep. they've been doing sequencing for Trevor Bedford since day one, right? Yep. 
It's terrific. Yeah, Alan, they also had the most uh, deaths from COVID introduction to begin with, right? Because it, it came there first, yeah. Yeah. It, it hit that um, retirement community. Yes, I guess. that's right. Oh, yeah. And there was a there was a terrific uh, special on uh, PBS at the beginning of that, describing how they got their act together immediately. Yeah, when it showed yeah, that's up right. that's uh, right. and got it under control. Yep. Alan, you take, take the next one, please. Whose is it? A a Alan, right? Oh, it's me. Okay. Uh, Anna writes, hello, I really appreciate all the information you provide and thank you for your expertise. When the vaccine data talks about efficacy, does it imply that the vaccine is effective with or without mitigations like masks and distancing? Thank you so much, Anna. I would say based on the phase three trials that have been done so far, they were they told people to continue masking and distancing. And many of these, certainly one of the ones in the U.S., were being done in places that mandated masking and distancing. So that effic those efficacy data are all from that. But I would point out that the efficacy data come from a total number of infections in the vaccinated versus control groups. So on the assumption that the placebo control group behaved in a similar manner to the vaccinated group, the number of infections should be a pretty clear indicator of the efficacy of the vaccine. That's a really good question. Yeah, right? it is a good question. I really like this when I first read it. I said, oh, no. And then I said, wait, this is really yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder because, you know, when you do an HIV trial, you have to counsel the participants on safe sex. And you have to say wear a condom. But what you do hope is that some of them will not do right. that because otherwise you don't get any infections. So here, yes, they have to tell you wear a mask, do distancing, blah, blah, blah. But a, you get some infections. However, what would I would assume that – or here's the question. Would the efficacy be the same if we were not in a masking situation? So at some point we're not going to wear masks and we're going to all have this vaccine. So – would that change the efficacy? I, I think the efficacy is going to be the same because you're basing the efficacy on infection count. I think the infection count in the placebo group would be a lot higher. All right. So no matter how you got infected, masking. it's it going to protect It doesn't matter you. how you got infected. Yeah. The fact that you got infected and you were yeah, in one true. or the other arm of the that's study exactly is right. what adds up to the So numbers. if you didn't wear masks, you'd have more infections. Yeah, but you'd be able to do the trial faster. Yes, you'd exactly. have more infections. <laughs> I mean, you should tell everybody, but that would be totally unethical. You want people to not right. get infected unless yeah and, and the one sort of asterisk that goes on this is that sometimes with these vaccine trials uh, if the vaccine has a little bit of a side effect and maybe the placebo does not um you hope that the two groups are being similar in their behavior um and that yes yeah. having side effects uh does not mean that you end up saying hey i got a vaccine who needs a mask yeah um so that that's a little bit of an asterisk here but we do make the assumption that the two groups behaved uh similarly and that's why you and, have a lot will, I, go ahead I, I will point out that after dose one of moderna i was pretty sure that i'd gotten a real vaccine <laughs> it, it made an impression you didn't get the placebo huh i did not get the placebo i but the, the next morning my body was definitely working on an adage in the way mike tyson works on a speed bag there was there was stuff <laughs> so that's why we have so many people in the placebo and vaccine yeah. group to make sure that as brian said that they're basically uh, acting in the same way. Right. So, Alan, I'll let you know because tomorrow Marlene gets hers. And it's a Moderna. I've got the Pfizer. Okay. And we're neck and neck. We're going to see who develops symptoms and who doesn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I'm, my understanding is that most people, it's very mild to, you know, yeah. and, and mine yeah. first dose was pretty mild. But, um, my wife's experience was it was first dose uh, and second dose just floored her. Really, Moderna. She was, but then she's, you know, it, it lasted like 24 hours and then she's fine. Uh, let's do one more, Brienne. Sure. Brent writes, I'm a family medicine physician in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I greatly appreciate your updates as they have guided me through this with my patient. The amount of bad information is astonishing and you have done an incredible job. Not only do I work in the outpatient setting in a clinic, but also go to the nursing home. The federal government brought up the first group of Binax now and have deployed them in the nursing homes routinely for the past several months. I get tested once or twice a week and every single patient as well as workers do as well. It works remarkably well at picking up symptomatic and pre-symptomatic infections. In my own office, it detected with five or six of my employees. I'm not sure, I'm a little confused here. 
it detected it, it detected five or six of my employees one or two days prior to symptom onset. They are very simple and easy to use. And if they were packaged slightly differently to be used at home, very easy with a second confirmatory test. I've been pulling my hair out for six months, wondering why the federal government has not approved these for at home use. I hope the new administration can get this figured out. By the way, even though this test can be used as an anterior nares to make it easier, it is easy to insert into the middle turbinate or posterior nasal pharynx because the swab is small enough. Yeah, it must be swab. Yeah. <laughs> we have everyone self swab. Um, with employees, this is actually easier and more comfortable once you get the te technique down. I have swabbed over 30 times, and at this point, I have very little to no discomfort. I always do a deeper swab because I think I'm getting a better test. Just wanted to give some real-world feedback. Keep up the good work. Uh, and this is from Brent, who is an MD. Mm. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. D D Daniel Wait, talked thanks, about uh, Binax now uh, on our last update. And... Um, yeah, it's it's too bad you can't you, you have to mail in something. I think that's how it works, uh, but it's also thirty five forty dollars a pop, you know, so a little expensive. All right, time to do some picks of the week, Dixon. What do you have? We have to get Dixon an unmuter. Uh, <laughs> I have an unmuter. <laughs> I, you know, I can't keep up. I, I, I mute and I don't mute and I get yelled at both ways. I don't get this. <laughs> okay. Life in a day. 2020. This is an ongoing um, documentary. It's a YouTube documentary. The first one was held last year, I believe. This is um, cell phone video from around the world collected on, in this case, I think it was July 25th of this last year. It is remarkable and it's with dialogue, it's with music, it's with um, some disturbing scenery. It covers the gambit from A to Z and then back again. Um, it will elicit virtually every emotion that you are capable of. And it's an hour and a half I'm long. In, I'm incapable of any except anger. <laughs> oh, you'll be happy with this one then. There's about three quarters of this will make you so angry. I mean, it, it shows the riots uh, for um, um, uh, Black Lives Matter. It shows a whole bunch of police brutality scenes and, uh, and not just in the United States. This is worldwide. So this is around the world. Uh, you will you'll be riveted. You won't be able to look away. You have to watch this. And uh, I didn't want to at the beginning. I was up early one morning and I and I saw the notice on Google, you know, here's a documentary, you should watch it. And I said, eh, I put it on. I ended up emotionally drained. All right, that's all I can tell you. And it's real life. These are real people. They're talking about real things. And there is some arcs of humor throughout. So you will you will you will love the way this thing is edited as well. Cool. It's it's just remarkable. Good. Nice. Excellent. Great. I'll have a look. Cool. Yep. Brianne, what do you have? Um, so I have something that there's there's a little bit of selfishness here. Um, I have a, something that I found on Indiegogo. It's actually on Indiegogo and um, another site. Um, but this is called Microcosms in Glass. And these are glass cubes um, where they have done laser engraving of different microbes um, or different cells. And they are just absolutely wow. gorgeous um i i am in awe of them and it looks like i found out about them right <laughs> as um the These ability to get them closed um and so hopefully i'm hoping that i will somehow find out how i can purchase one um now uh, i that's been my new quest um because these are just so gorgeous and i i need them all <laughs> and i thought that everyone else would probably want them as well this is cool I, I uh, so I wanted to show you one, a couple of years ago. I gave a Julie Youngner lecture, and they gave me this, mm. which is the same thing. It's etched inside the glass. Oh yeah, that's polio virus, by the way. Lovely, oh, neat, very cool. And you put it on. It gave it to me with a light stand that it <laughs> goes on, so it illuminates. You can put any color light, like some of these have underneath them. Right. Um, you can have any. I don't know how they do this, but it's the same because I see the bacteriophages printed inside. 
lasered inside the how did they do that <laughs> i don't know but it's so cool it's very and cool so i i need to figure out how i'm going to get some of these cubes from this indiegogo i'm guessing it's some kind of like a laser interference 3d printing technology but i don't know yeah, i don't know exactly how cool. that works these are cool they've got it looks like they've got a little um they've got some description on how they make them here yeah, there's a little bit of a description, but I am not so, good enough understanding laser engraving. I guess you don't have an industrial uh, 3D printing. Laser Brianna, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's cool. uh, I have cool. one on my desk at work where Vincent's is sitting right now that was given to me by um, the director of the American Museum of Natural History. And it's an engraved blue whale on the inside. So cool. it's the largest animal that's ever lived on the planet. And here you're showing us the smallest <laughs> things that have ever lived on the planet. So yes. we should put them together sometime. We should. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> Uh, Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a, a sort of a double link. So one is a New England Journal of Medicine article. It's open access. Um, this is called Beyond Politics, Promoting COVID-19 Vaccination in the United States. And it's uh, Stacey Wood and Kevin Shulman. Um, and then the other link is an interview with Stacey Wood, who's the first author on this, um, who is a professor of marketing at North Carolina State University Business School. Hmm. And so what does a professor of marketing have to say about vaccination? Well, it's actually really interesting. And this is something that anybody who's who's passionate about this topic really ought to read. Because um, as, as scientists, we want to say, well, you know, the vaccine is safe because data, 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 right? Uh, turns out that is exactly the wrong approach to people who are hesitant about vaccines. And this article outlines... Um, very much, you know, the right approaches, the things that work in marketing are not talking about the data and the facts. Yeah, you need those and you should be able to cite them to people who are curious, but what's going to convince people who are hesitant are stories. Um, you know, narrative, the, I, I got mine, you know, I want my family to get theirs. My, I've made sure grandpa got his. That carries a lot more weight than 95% efficacy you know, no, no toxicity, et cetera. Uh, well, gee, that's interesting in the abstract, but, but what's the story? Um, and there are other mechanisms. Uh, there's actually something that's, that's working in our favor right now is the supply shortages um, because humans respond very well to scarcity. We want stuff that's scarce. We have this need to, well, gosh, it's not available. I better get it and that fear of missing out. And right now there's a tremendous drive by people to get the vaccine because it's scarce. It's a special thing, uh, but we can't rely on that because we are going to get to a point where we vaccinated everybody who was in that initial drive. And then we're going to get to the people who are genuinely hesitant and we're going to have to um, convince them, you know, that this is something worth getting. And this is, this is a very detailed and, and I think good guide on how to do that. So, Alan, Excellent. you're saying the key is if someone says, why should I get that vaccine? You say, well, you can't have it anyway, so don't even bother. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. I got it. Uh, Rich, what do you have for us? Okay, so uh, my main pick here is I think probably a repick, okay? Uh, but uh, I'm putting it up here for new listeners. I'm not even sure that it was, uh, it's updated as well. It's called the Microbe Scope from a site called Information is Beautiful. Uh, and it's an interactive plot that compares or demonstrates the relative uh, infectiousness of different pathogens uh, and the relative mortality. Uh, in, and it puts one on one axis and one on the other axis, so it scatters them out. And so you can see where your favorite pathogen uh, falls on this plot. Not only that, but it's really nice. If you hover over any given pathogen with your cursor, it gives you the precise uh, data on the contagiousness and mortality and gives you a little description of the pathogen and what it does. So I just find this a fascinating site that I can play with. And Great. I would say that not only that, 
But if you look at the uh, axes labels, they are actually drop down menus. Yes. And so you can change the axes to other it's parameters beautiful. like awareness, media coverage, new cases per year, fatalities, number of sufferers. Uh, so this is a wealth of information in a fabulously uh, 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 demonstrative, interactive. It's really uh, nice presentation. And look really at versus media coverage. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> so the I'm uh, not seeing the linear trend yeah, I'd yeah. like to see this, here. This is it's so not linear, useful, Rich. Rich, no. Rich, thank you because it's so this useful. Is great. So the logarithmic uh, Dixon, <laughs> the most the pathogens with the highest are not malaria. And lymphatic there philariasis. There you go. Isn't that incredible? Malaria has an R naught of 17. And measles, <laughs> you know, nine, according to this. That was what we always thought. So that's amazing. Yeah. I didn't recognize yeah, that's that. That's amazing. Dixon. Right. Yep. You were going to do a parasite podcast, Dixon. You know, that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> I'll look into it. <laughs> so wow. I've also pasted in here for, you can put it in the show notes, the... Uh, off its uh, vaccine education center, which looks like a great site uh, for, uh, you know, when people, I never know quite where to send people when they, when they ask me, you know, where can I get good information about vaccines? I mean, the CDC works well and et cetera. I have a little trouble sometimes digging around in the CDC site. I haven't dug around much in this, but uh, uh, it looks uh, on the surface at least is very good. And we can certainly rely on, uh, 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 and offer uh, off it sponsored uh, resource as being reliable. And I also paste good. it in here, this uh, cartoon. Yeah, cartoon's from, great, yeah. Uh, the smallpox um, anti-vaxxers. It's all like Gary Larson. Centuries ago. <laughs> and this is deep too. You can drill down by specific vaccines and get more information. This is really, really that good. Looks, it's so great. I would expect nothing less. I'm going to pick in honor of our guest, uh, one of his books, Autism's. False Prophets, Paul Offit. He's a wonderful writer. Um, here's uh, the prologue from this book. He writes, I get a lot of hate mail. Every week, people send letters and emails calling me stupid, callous, an SOB, or a prostitute. People ask, how in the world can you put money before the health of someone's baby? Or how can you sleep at night? Or why did you sell your soul to the devil? They say, I don't have a conscience. I'm directly responsible for the death and damage of hundreds of children and have blood on my hands. They pray that the love of Christ will one day flood my darkened heart. They warn that my day of reckoning is coming. To understand the reason for your anger, you need to understand the decisions I've made. I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> I grew up in Baltimore. <laughs> it's it's good. really good. Great. It's really good That's book. That's great. And he was written a lot of other good books too as well. I guess including the the biography of uh, Maurice Hilleman, right? Yeah. Yep, that's yep. vaccinated. That's one vaccinated, that I really like. and uh, he also has a book on vaccines for parents, which he gave me as a PDF. He said, "Give it to anybody who wants it, who, who asks you really good uh, stuff about vaccines." So I, I can put a link to that one in too. Uh, then we have a, a listener pick today from Earl. I wanted to point out that the. The great pins made by this company, no financial interest. I especially like the I enjoy not having polio pin and thought of you. So this is a site uh, called Science is Real, and it's they got pins. Cool. A lot of Science is Real. Uh, they have a vaccine syringe pin. They have an uh, I enjoy not having polio pin. And yeah, there the pictures are showing up now. Oh, they're very pretty. Thanks, science, with a little syringe. That's cool. Wow, these are cool. You're in good hands. I washed mine. That's I nice. Like these. <laughs> these are beautiful. Very nice. You can play with me. I'm measles free. That's great. Uh, you got little uh, earrings with... Um, Thank you for vaccinating files. your miniature snot factory. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, I'm thinking of buying some for my wife. He writes, longtime listener with 30 plus years experience in virology, waiting on a FedEx delivery of two isolates of SARS-CoV-2 so I can drive them over to the BSL-3 lab in Stillwater, main campus. I have TWIVs 7, 13, and 14 queued up and ready for the drive and lab work. Uh, one of the most useful things I find about the podcast is finding out what isn't known. I've spent a lot of time searching pubs for answers to questions, publications, not pubs. <laughs> and, and when you say it isn't known on your podcast, it saves me a lot of time. Thank Amy for her enterovirus advice from several years ago. 
Uh, Earl is a professor of microbiology at Oklahoma State University. Thank you, cool. Earl. It's a great, yeah, cool. great site. Very it cool. Is. I, I might have to get some vaccine vial earrings. You need to go spend some money, Brianne. Go ahead. <laughs> nice. No point in saving it. All right. That is TWIV720, microbe.tv slash TWIV for the show notes. You can send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to send us some money, some support, you can send that to microbe.tv slash contribute. Well, actually, you have to go there and decide how you want, want to send it. But we love your support. We have many of you who support us. And we are very grateful for helping to get this done. Dixon de Pommier, trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. I think you should buy pizzabox.org, Dixon. Well, if you knew what was behind each one of those, you'd be surprised, Vincent. They're a little bit more valuable than pizzas, but that's okay. I want to thank you for giving me that poem to read. I feel like I'm becoming the poet laureate of this <laughs> podcast. It was done. I want, on, I want to do all of them. I, I'm was, having a lot of fun with that. It was done on purpose. I know you like to read poems. No, I do. I do. I do. And the, by the way, behind him, it's his art. It's his flies that no, no, he's no. made things. They're right? not my flies. They're Walt Deddy's flies, but they're my enlargements and if i could show you one of them go ahead did you scan I, them and print them is that right Dixon? i can now you see in the back of me yeah yeah oh, oh, a couple yeah. hanging on the wall right, right over there it's beautiful the i will i will um i'll, I'll um i'll do something what are you going to do with when you actually picture. when you finally have a gallery opening with these yes, we I can all tell you that, that your flies are showing you know thank <laughs> you so much and they're all dry uh, no, these are actually wet flies. So, <laughs> what are you going to do with the prints that you made there in the bar, in the black frames? I'm uh, planning an exhibit at a uh, Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum uh, opening in April. Are you going to drive them there? Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah. I have to just have to drive them there. You, you, you think I should them fly them? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I scale them up to the Catskills. Cast them. <laughs> I could. I could do that. Very good. No, they're quite beautiful. They're works of art. The man who tied them claimed that he was a uh, craftsman. He was not an artist. But when you enlarge them and look at them up close, they're artistic. They're quite wonderful, actually. Very nice. I like Nixon, that. You're stuff. a Renaissance man and a bundle of energy. No, stop Great. it. Stop it. I'm about to run out of steam. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> I like the stack. It looks cool behind you. It's very neat. Yeah, that's. Uh, I had that fun doing that. There's 28 of them all together because the fly shop is named after him. It's called the Deddy Fly Shop. And the, uh, they opened in 1928. So they want to do nice. 28 of these flies as a presentation. Cool. Cool. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thank you, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Good Condit. to see your face again, Brianne. Good to see you too. <laughs> What's what? You haven't seen her in what, a week, Dixon? Long time. No, no. Two She's weeks. not on Fridays usually. Two weeks. So yes. Yeah, she is. is. She is. Some Fridays. Well, maybe I'm thinking of Kathy. Kathy's not on Friday. That's, yeah. no, that's not Kathy. No, that's I'm not. You, you did also get to see a. I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> there was a brief Athena appearance. Yes, I, me too. I saw Athena go through briefly. <laughs> Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, great episode. Always a good time. Yeah, good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com and on the Twitter, Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.